testing it. There it went. Whoa. It's close. How about now? No, we got a good bat. We got a good echo going. It's all right. We'll figure it out. Um, in your case, I think I just got to get you a good. What is the main problem down there, anyways? Is it just the video or the speaker system or what? I don't have any speakers on my computer. Well, we'll have to we'll have to get that corrected. So. I had to bring my own camera too. You brought your own webcam? Why? I this sent one, one down for Salem. This one's from James. I brought the other one. Why? I could have sent. I sent two down to him. I sent one for Land. Time and I was anxious. Okay, I sent James down two of them. I sent him down the lock boxes for the doors. Yeah. Um, and and that was need... last week, but Stacy's classes started the week before. Okay, I'll send you down some better ones. I have some Logitech ones. So, I'll send you down some better ones. Oh, gosh. All right. So, I should have this, the dependency tests. This is to find out if someone qualifies as your dependent. Okay? This is really a good guideline it is set up as a thought process so you understand um, what the three guidelines are. The general tests are dependency, joint uh, return test, and the citizenship test. So um, they actually use a guide. It's dogs jump creeks. Okay. Um, it makes it so that particular saying helps some people uh, learn it. There are several others, and actually I think I'm going to go through a number of others as well, but this is one we've got so far. Okay, number one, the general test to determine a dependency. Okay, they must pass all three tests. The dependent taxpayer test. Now, you cannot qual qualify as a dependent of someone else um, so in other words, you have to be only a, uh, you cannot qualify as a dependent of someone else. Okay. So in other words, somebody else cannot claim you as a dependent. Okay. That's the dependency test. So, um, it is about the taxpayer. You is not possible, not possible for you to be a dependent. If you qualify as a dependent of, of another, you fail this test, even if that other person does not claim you on their return. Okay, that's very important. So even if they don't claim you, um, you will fail. Okay, so you do not qualify as a dependent if someone can claim you, even if they do not claim you. Okay. The joint return test. The possible dependent does not file a joint return. In other words, they cannot file a joint return. Okay, they can only file a return themselves. Um, the only exception is they can file a joint return only to get a refund of overpaid taxes. Okay. All right, and the citizenship or residency test. They must be a citizen or a resident of North America. Okay, there is only one exception, and that is if it's an adopted child, a child who is not a U.S. citizen or resident of the U.S., adopted by a citizen, will pass this test only if that child lives with the adopting parent all year. God, these things read like stereo instructions, honestly. Um, and I think I need to go through and actually put these in English. Um, because right now I think they're written in Chinese. Um, so, and I have to find a better mnemonic than dogs jump creeks. So anyways, so, dependence. 
if to determine if someone qualifies as your dependent, there's a dependency test, a joint return test, and a citizen or resident test. So, dependency test. Can you qualify as a dependent for someone else? If you do, you do not get to be qualified as a dependent. Okay, even if that person does not cho uh, choose to uh, claim you. Okay, the joint return test, possible dependent, does not file a joint return. The exception is to fi if they file a joint return only to get a refund of overpaid taxes. Wow, this thing does read like stereo instructions. Um, I can tell I didn't put these slides together. So citizenship or resident test must be a citizen or a resident of North America. Must be a U.S. citizen or a resident of North America. All right, let's fix that. There we go. I hate reminders. Okay. So, now let's continue. A citizen or the resident must be a U.S. citizen or a resident of North America. The exception is the adopted child. A child who is not a U.S. citizen or a resident of the U.S. adopted by a U.S. citizen will pass the test only if that child lives with the adopting parent all year. So in other words, if they live uh, outside the U.S., okay, if they are adopted by a U.S. citizen. Wow, that does not make it clear. We're going to work on that one. Uh, test to determine if someone qualifies as your dependent. Okay, there's a relation, the qualifying child test. We're going to work on this one too. The relationship test. It has to be a relationship, and we have to do the relationship test to start any variation of your child, sibling, or descendant. Okay. Must be an adopted child, a foster child, or a relationship that is created by marriage does survive the marriage. In other words, stepchild, boy, they do not clarify that. I really have to go through these and cl clear this up. Okay. So the relationship test, it's got to be your child. It's got to be a sibling, or it's got to be a, one of their children. So in other words, your niece, nephew, all right, or your grandchild, or your child, okay? Those are ones that uh, would qualify. So we're talking about your child or their child. So in other words, your child or your grandchild, your sibling, so your brother <coughs> or sister, or their children, which would be your niece or nephew, okay? The exceptions to that are an adopted child that is legally adopted, a foster child placed by the, um, by the foster agency or a court, or relationships that are created by a marriage. Those are technically what? Your stepkids. Anything that are qualified? In-laws. In-laws. The ones that were created by a marriage. Guess what? If I marry somebody and I now have nieces and nephews, I have got two nieces who I love dearly, okay? I, well, I've got actually a bunch of nieces who I love dearly. Some are my biological ones, Clarice, Marion. Those are my two oldest ones. I've also got um, uh, Lizel, all these in the Philippines. Clarice and Marion are both in the Philippines. I love them like they're my own daughters, okay? They're now 24 and 22. I cannot help it. I love those two girls so much. Guess what? If something happened, and for whatever reason, I can't ever envision why because I love my wife more than anything. But if for some reason, Shell and I were not together, they're my nieces and nephews by marriage, okay? I cannot divorce them. I actually have to legally go to court to separate myself from them. Okay. 
even though I'm divorced, if I divorced or whatever happens between Shell and I, my relationship does not change between my nieces and me. They are still my nieces. Okay? Those do not go away. You actually have to divorce each one. and It is actually considered a divorce for each of your relations. All right? You have to legally go to court. So those do not change. I know most people don't think that, but it's true. So when you get married, all of those that all those relationships that were formed stay formed. So with me, they're mine till we die. Okay. So they're they're with you till you die. So that's the relationship. The age test. Under age 19, so 18, guys. I don't ever understand why it says under age 19. Okay. If they're 18 or younger, or however you want to put it, up to age 18, including age 18. If they're 18, so, or a full-time student under age 24, so age 23 or permanently and totally disabled. Okay. Those are the age tests. All right. That's the primary age test. Also, the possible dependent must be younger than the taxpayer or spouse. It's kind of a really strange requirement. Okay. Um, because unless they're totally disabled, because you may have, nephews and nieces who are technically older than you. Okay. So it is very true. It may be possible, but they must be younger than the taxpayer or the spouse. Now a full-time student is actually really important. Full-time student, because what is a full-time student? Ideas, guys. What's a full-time student? Five months out of the year. Five months? Five months out of the year. But what does that, what does that entail? 12 credit hours. Thank you. That's the important part. Most people don't actually follow that as well. What does it entail? You right have here. to have this. It has to be at least five months during yeah. the tax year for a specified number of credits as defined by the school. So in other words, five months out of the year for a certain number of credits. So in other words, each school has a set number of credits that it must qualify as. Now that's important because sometimes you think that, oh, well, I was in class. I took a class here, here, and here. Five months does not mean one class. Okay. Yeah. It does mean one class if you're doing independent research, however, because that is however many credit hours I needed. Um, I could have that go all day. Does it but mean 12 hours? It means uh, however is specified Whatever. by the school. Yeah. Most school, schools are 12 hours now. Yeah, most are, most are 12 hours, 12 yeah. credit hours. Was when I went to college. Okay. So, and it also depends on usually if they're on a semester or a trimester or uh, what their actual schedule is. Because ironically enough, depending upon if you go to school here or if you go to school back east, they're entirely different. Okay. Because here we go on quarters and there they actually go on semesters. Okay. So it will depend on where you go to school. Okay. So that will determine how many credit hours it takes. All right. But you have to go as defined by that school and be a full-time student. And those are the two first two tests. So relationship, age. Now let's talk about the residency. This is the next one. And this one's really important. The residency, you must have lived with you more than half the year. Okay? 
the qualifying person must have lived with you more than half of the year. That makes sense. All right. So more than half the year they were with you. Now there are exceptions to this. There are temporary absences. They go to summer camp. Okay. That does not qualify as taking them away from you. Okay. They have a visitation with their grandmother. That does not qualify um, as being taken away from you. If a child is born or died during the year, that does not qualify as being taken away from you. Um, if the child is kidnapped, God help you, if the child is kidnapped, that is not considered as an absence. Okay. <clears throat> I'd hate to think, I, I really, I, for, for whatever reason, I hate to think of two parents fighting over who gets to claim a child because they were, and because they were kidnapped. I know. You know, I, I, honest to God, I would hate to see two parents fighting over who gets to claim a child because of the length of time that they were supposedly together because one, you know, the child were, was kidnapped at part of the year. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But yes, it does happen. Divorced or separated parents, a non-custodial parent may claim that child that did not live with him more than half the year if the child lived with both parents more than half the year and both pr parents provided more than half the child's support and the parents did not live together during the last half of the year and the non-custodial parent gets the custodial parent to sign a form 8332. Like I said, this is like reading stereo instructions. Okay? But the truth is, what it's saying is, if you have divorced or separated parents, yes, they can be there. They, if, they're, if they're with parents part of the year and, and not part of the year, if both parents combined provided more than half of the year with the child, that's theirs to claim. It doesn't matter which parent provided it, but combined they have their more than half the year. Okay. But with separated or divorced parents, they may be with a parent. Okay. So those absentee periods don't qualify as absentee periods. Okay, so those are residency. They must have lived with you more than half the year. And guys, use common sense. These exceptions are pretty much ridiculous. I'll be honest. To count kidnapping a child as an exception to the rule, the fact that they even have that in there is pretty much proof that mankind should probably go away sometimes. Okay, <laughs> to have that as a rule in there, you know, I mean, really, come on. So, if they lived with you more than half the year, that's the test. Okay, the support test. The dependent can't have provided more than half of their own support. The question is, did you supply more than half of their support? All right, did you supply it? If you did, guess what? You are their qualifying, uh, qualifying supporter, their qualifying person. All right? So that is the actual test. And they have it as RARS, R-A-R-S, because it's the relationship test. Was it your child? Okay, child or sibling? Or one of their kids? Okay, what is the age? 19 or under? Uh, under 19, okay, 18 or younger, okay, pretty simple. What's the age of being an adult? All right, 18. 18. Congratulations. If you're 18 or younger, that's the test. A full-time student, under 24, okay, pretty simple. Or permanently and totally disabled, okay? Those are the tests. A qualifying child has a residency test. Did they live with you more than half a year? It's not too hard. And the support test. Did you provide more than half of their own their support? Very simple. Okay. Now, let's see here. Test to determine if someone qualifies as your dependent. Now, this is not 
necessarily <clears throat> a qualifying relative. This is not just a child. This is a qualifying relative. Okay. The qualifying child test is they cannot be the qualifying child of someone who is required to file or actually file a tax return. Okay. So in other words, they cannot be somebody else's qualifying child. Okay. The relationship test. They have to have any variation of your child. So sibling, parent, in-law or descendant, aunt and uncle, or someone who has lived with you for the entire year. Okay. That's the difference. Right? This is for a qualifying relative. This is not just a qualifying child. This is a qualifying relative. Okay? Number one is, are they a qualifying child? Okay? They cannot be a qualifying child of someone else. Okay? So, in other mm -hmm. words, if they've qualified as somebody else's qualifying child, they cannot be your qualifying relative. The relationship <laughs> tests... Okay. They, any vari variation of your child, your sibling, your parent, your in-law, or your descendant, or uncle and aunt, or someone who has lived with you for the entire year. Okay. Very simple. That last part is, or someone who has lived with you for the entire year. Their gross income tech, uh, test. They can't have more than $4,050, period. If it equals $4,050 or more, they cannot qualify as a qualifying relative. So in other words, they cannot have an income more than $4,050. Now it's for 2017, and we'll update it for 2018. Okay? And then the support test is very simple. You must provide more than half of this person's support. Okay? That's very simple. Let's find out if they're a qualifying relative because they're different than a qualifying child. Okay? But it's very simple. This is just to find out. This is for dependency. All right. Now for the tiebreaker rules. These rules are a pain in the butt. Anybody had to go through tiebreaker rules? Not in real life. I've had to go through them four times. Mm -mm. In all the years I've been doing this, I've had to use <coughs> tiebreaker rules four times. And they are a royal pain in the butt because everybody wants to claim the child. The tiebreaker rules are used when one person can claim the other, the same dependent, on different returns. So it's basically two parents trying to claim a child. And they are a pain in the butt because both parents want to have it. And we have to start applying the tax the, the tiebreaker rules. And it has gone to basically where you have to sit down and go, hey, we show that we've had them this many months. And sometimes it comes down to days. You know, days within a single uh, single year. How many days during this year did you have them versus me? Okay. So, the parent rule. If only one taxpayer is the parent, the parent gets them, period. There is no debate on this. It doesn't matter how long they've been with them. Whatever. If one is a parent and, like, one is a grandparent and one is trying to claim the dependent, the parent gets it, Period. No matter what the situation is, if one of them is a parent, they get to claim it. It supersedes every other rule. All right? Then the longest live with rule. The parent, like let's say two parents, are debating this. The longest live with rule. So the parent with whom the dependent lived the longest. In other words, if one lived with it for seven and one lived with it for five months, guess what? Seven month gets it. Now here's the, when it gets really tricky. When one lived with it for six and a half months and the other one lived with it for five and a half months and they start getting to where they start splitting hairs over a couple of days 
And yes, that has happened. And yes, it is a royal pain in the butt. Because they start trying to prove days to each other. Not just, you know, well, during Christmas, I had them from this date and this date and this date. And during the 4th of July, I had them from this date and this date and this date. And next thing you know, I mean, they're literally fighting over who had them for days. Okay. Um, that happens when parents cannot agree. And that one really hurts the child. Then the highest AGI rule. Now, this one I don't actually see as fair, but it is the rule. If they have lived with them literally the exact same amount of time, both of them had six months out of the year or whatever, you know, they can show exactly the same amount of time together and it's two parents, then it falls under an income level. Whichever one has the highest adjusted gross income gets to claim them because that means that they will get the highest benefit basically from that dependent. That's the one who gets to claim them. Now, I don't necessarily think that one's fair, but that is the IRS rule that the parent with the highest AGI gets it. Now, if neither parent, now this is for the non-parents here, and this is the fourth rule. If neither parent claiming, and if neither person claiming the dependent are the parents, it is the person with the highest average gross income. Okay, so those are ridiculous rules that have to come into effect. I've had them come into effect four times. They are a pain in the butt to try to enforce, and you will have more fights over people. I've seen actually one case where they wanted to actually come to blows over this thing. Okay, they actually wanted the husband and wife trying to claim the children wanted to beat each other over this. Um, they hated each other that much. And I said, you know, honestly, you have your kids here. Do you really want to do this here? You know, is this really worth it? <clears throat> and it's like, no, it's never worth it. And they both stopped and they both realized what they were doing. And I'm hoping that they actually corrected it because I never did their taxes after that. I was done with them. But if either parent, if both of them are not the parents, the person with the highest AGI gets to claim them. So let's do some quick tests, okay? Can I ask really? one question really quick? Sure. Um, if they have it written in their um, divorce paper, who gets the kids, does that supersede that everything supersedes else? supersedes everything else. Okay. That is an actual divorce decree from a court saying this person gets to claim them. It supersedes everything else. Okay. I had my daughter put that in her divorce papers. Yep. That actually overrides all the other stuff. So, um, no, they do not get to go outside of that. No, they do not get to try to get around that. That is a court ordered change. And no matter how much they don't like it, and this is a bad thing, no matter how, how they will fight it, they will, um, hate it. They will whatever. It does not make a difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is a court ordered rule and that is the rule. Okay. Alrighty. That's good. You know. Yep. So Walt and Julie are married U S citizens. Their son guy was born while they lived in France. So which of the following is true? So guy Oops. cannot be Walt and Julie's dependent. Well, that's not true. <laughs> Guy fails the citizenship or resident test. No, that's not true. They're U.S. citizens. So even though mm -hmm. they live, were born while they're in France, it doesn't matter. Guy must move to the U.S. before he passes the citizen or residency <laughs> test. That would be cool. He's got to move to the U.S. Okay, no problem. So Guy meets the citizen or residence test. Guy meets it. Yes. Okay, Paulette supported her daughter, 18, and they lived together all year while Andrea 
uh, well, Andrea's husband, Carl, was in the armed forces. Carl is required to file a tax return, so Andrea and Car Carl filed jointly. Had they filed separately, Carl would have been required to file, but Andrea would not. Which of the following statements is true? The joint return test is not met for Andrea or for Carl. Interesting. The joint test is met for Andrea only. The joint test is met for Carl only. The joint test is met for Andrea and Carl. Let's see here. So, Paulette supported her daughter, Andrea, and they lived all lived together all year while Andrea's husband was in the armed forces. Huh. Mm -hmm. So, what happened here? So they are married. Andrea is married to Carl, and Andrea lived with um, her mom, Paulette, while he was overseas. So, she's wondering, can Andrea be claimed by Paulette? So does it really matter had they filed separately? Carl would have been required to file, but Andrea would not. So even though, here's the thing, remember it said, the joint test is not met for Andrea or for Carl. The reason is, why? Because even though they chose to file separately, they can have filed jointly. So they can't have filed, one of them's required to file. Okay, so as one of them is required to file, guess what? That is not met for Andrea or Carl. One can file jointly. So no matter what, it's not, uh, um, they can't choose to file separately. because he would have been required to file, even though she would not. So yes, the joint test is not met for either one. Okay, because you can't have it met for one and not met for the other. All right. Yvette, 22 is single and not a dependent of anyone else. Her niece, Angela, came to live with her on February 1st of the tax year. Angela is not married. Yvette provided more than half of Angela's support and no one else lived with them. Okay. So what is she? That's her, that's her niece. Okay. So what is she? That is her relationship. So we've got a relationship test. It's been February. So all year, the support. No one else lived with them, more than half of the support. So we've got pretty much everything, don't we? Mm -hmm. we got the support, we've got the residency, we've got the relationship. So Angela is Yvette's qualifying child. Mm -hmm. Right? Then their age, they're good. Everything's good there. So we're good. It is her qualifying child. Now for a qualifying relationship. Dana and her son Tommy lived with Dana's boyfriend, Asa, for the entire year. Their relationship does not violate local law. That's important because if it does violate local law, then it's considered an illegal marriage and, or a legal arrangement and it nullifies it. Asa is not Tommy's father. That's interesting but he provided more than half of the support for Dana and Tommy. Dana's only income is wages of $2,813, and she is not a qualifying child for anyone. Dana is not required to and does not file a tax return. So let's go down the list here. How old are they? Well, Tommy is a child. What is their relationship? They lived with Dana's boyfriend, so they don't have that relationship. Um, so they have to have, if they lived with them all year, so they did, 
they lived with Asa for, uh, they lived with Dana's boyfriend, Asa, for the entire year. So we've got the entire year. So we've got the amount of residency. Their relationship um, is now Asa is not Tommy's father. But he provided more than half the support for Dana and Tommy. Okay, so he gave him half the support. All right, so he gave him half the support. Dana's income level is before below the four thousand fifty, right? So we're good there. And she does not qualify as a child for anyone else, so no one else can claim her. And she is not required to file a tax return. All right, so let's see what this means. She is, she doesn't require a tax return. She is under, the Dana and Tommy are under him. He provided the housing, he provided the support, and they live with him the entire year. That's the important thing, the entire year. So based on that, now Asa then can claim both Dana and Tommy as dependents. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. Because we've got the relationship. We've got the support. We've got the ages. We've got the income levels. We've got the residency. Everything's in place. All right. Lenny, 19, is not a student and has been doing yard work since he was age 16 to earn money to buy a car. This year, he made over $5,000 maintaining yards in the neighborhood. Lenny lives with his father, Bruce, and Bruce provides more than half of Lenny's support. Bruce can claim Lenny as which of the following? Well, let's put it this way. Lenny is 19. What does that tell you already? Over 18. He's over 18. He made He's over not a student. He's not a student. Okay. And he made over $5,000, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see. If we're looking for a qualifying relative, we know he's over 18 so that screwed that one up he made over five thousand dollars that screws that up um he lives with his father bruce now he bruce provides more than half of lenny's support well that one's good but we know he's over the age we know he made over the amount of money so immediately he's not going to be a qualifying child and he's not going to be a qualifying relative. Okay, so he's neither a qualifying child nor a qualifying relative. All right. If that five thousand dollars, if that five thousand dollars was Social Security, would that still count? Um. Social Security is technically not um, earned income. Right. So, no. Okay. So, then you wouldn't, then if he, if that was Social Security income, then he would qualify. No, he's still 19. That's true. All right. He is not a student. And he's not a student. Okay. Mm -hmm. He is not a student, so. So that I mean, that that kicked it out too. So even if this had been Social Security, it still doesn't make a difference. He's 19 and not a student. So okay. this is actually thrown out by two 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 right. ways. Right. So if he was 18 and that was Social Security, then, then he would, would qualify. Then he would qualify. Okay. Okay. Zach provides more than half support for both of his parents. Okay, that's cool. We know there's a relationship already. Who lives in their own apartment? Okay, well, that's a little weird. Let's talk about here. His parents have gross income of $8,000 in non-taxable Social Security benefits and are not required to file a tax return. Zach wants to claim both of his parents as dependents. Okay, well, let's see. He provides more than half of the support mm -hmm. for his parents. Okay, we've got the relationship. We know it's his parents, so that's okay there. Um. Basically, it sounds like all year long now, they do not have, they are parents. They're that special one, okay? They are parents, so they do not have to live with him necessarily. 
Okay, as parents, he can support them even though they do not live uh, do not live with them. So okay, we're good there. Parents have gross income. Now this is two of them of eight thousand dollars. So what does that mean? Each one, and but these are Social Security benefits. So that in itself means it is non-taxable Social Security benefits. So it doesn't qualify. It's non-taxable Social Security benefits. It's not income, right? Right. Right. And they are not required to file a tax return. Great. So guess what? Zach can claim both of his parents. Right. So yes, this one qualifies. He can claim both of his parents. All right. Now let's check the tiebreaker rules. Hate these things. Bert and Ernestine. What's that? Oh, okay. Bang, you're talking to you. Okay. Bert and Ernestine are married and filing separate returns. Their daughter, Dora, is 10. is a qualifying child for both parents. They all live together from January 1st until December 15th of the tax year when Ernestine moved into a separate home with Dora. Now, that should tell you something. Mm-hmm. Bert's AGI is 59000 and Ernestine's is 42000 Bert and Ernestine each file a, a return claiming Dora as their qualifying child. Using the tax breaker rules, who is allowed to qualify, who claimed Dora as a qualifying child? Well, what's it go off of? They're both parents. Get okay, that immediately wipes out the parent one. Okay, they're both parents. So that, that has the, they both have a right to her. The next one is who had them the longest? Well, that's immediate. Yeah. They lived together until December. Ernestine. So only Ernestine. Okay, so that is right off the bat. So Lulu, 17, is a qualifying child for both of her parents. Dean and Vivica. Who names all these people in this thing? We've got to work on these. <laughs> Dean and Vivica are not married. But they and Lulu live together the entire year. Okay. Dean's AGI is fifty-five thousand and Vivica's is thirty-seven thousand. Dean and Vivica both claim Lulu on their tax returns. Using the tiebreaker room rule, who is allowed to claim her? Now Yep, Dean, because we've got, first, they live together the entire year, so we've wiped out that one. They're both parents, but they are not married, so that doesn't make any difference. But they're both parents. They live together the same amount of time, so now it goes to the AGI, and Dean's is higher than Vivica's, so only Dean. All right. So, I have a question. Yeah. If they both send in a tax return... Then does the IRS kick it out because there's two people claiming there, and who goes over the tiebreaker rules? Then there's basically the an audit. And, okay, yeah. But I, I'm sorry. What I ends up? No, no. <laughs> what's happening is um, you're right to ask because a lot of people don't know what happens. Um, they both get rejected, even if one has has already been filed, they will basically yeah. both then get rejected. And that will then put them both in peril because what happens is at that point, they are both being audited. You have to now supply information showing who has a right to claim them. Now, it's really not necessarily an audit, but it is a proof of your right. In other words, they're going to ask yeah. not, an, it won't be an official audit, but what it will be is something saying um, another person has uh, claimed this as well. You have to now show your right to claim it and to get this. Both of them have to be a paper return then. And it sucks because even if your yours went through, here's the bad thing. Let's say I am the 
honest parent who has the right to claim it. All right. I file my return with all of the information showing I have an honest return um, with everything to claim it. I submit it and my return goes through. I got everything in first. Mm -hmm. Right. So it goes through and I got my refund and all. Everything went through like it was supposed to. Now, my wife or the other parent decides I'm going to claim it. So they file. Now two people have claimed it. What happens to my return? Even though I filed it and everything was fine with mine, guess what happens to my get return? Audited too. I get audited. I get rejected. Mm -hmm. My my completed return goes from a filing status of accepted to rejected. It will change the status of mine, and I actually end up with a letter. Um, my return is still on file, but I now get a letter basically saying that it, there is a conflict, and I need to prove my side. Okay. So mm -hmm. even though I was completely straight up with mine and everything was fine, because the other person did it, I have to prove my side. And to prove it, now I have to show my AGI is on there, but I have to show the residency of the child, what they were, and actually, usually, what normally shows residency. Got an idea? School um, records. School records. That is actually what shows 90% of the residency is the school records of the child. Now, here's the problem is if both of them live in the same school district. Yeah. If both of them actually live in the same school district, then it really becomes an issue because then you have to then start showing things like doctor records and visits to the hospital and everything as to who it was signed by, who had the actual child, who the parents were talking to, because school records can say, um, I don't know who the parent was. I just basically know who, you know, both parents live within the district. Who are you going to say they lived with? You don't know. You know, all I can show is I went to this school. So then you have to start showing your dental records, what parent was with them, which parent signed it, and that's then what has to prove it. So, yes, it's a pain. Yes, it is possible to do, but you might as well be going to court over a child. And the parents, the child actually hopefully the parent the child is not old enough to understand what's going on i can honestly say that hopefully they don't understand it because they're being dragged through something they never should yeah so all you right know that as a child of a divorced parents right yep it's me too <laughs> yeah i i know uh, how that feels i was a senior yeah. the bad part was i was a senior in high school i understood it all i wanted to yeah. shoot both of them yep you know, it was um, like the worst time of my life. Oh, well, I thought my dad was dead, but that's another story. But um, You thought your dad was dead? My dad was taking regular trips to Vietnam to drop. He was a pilot, and he was dropping off um, soldiers. Oh, Beth. So he didn't come home. back. I was 10, and he didn't come back in the right amount of time. So I thought maybe he was shot down over there or something. And then we went to the, which made it worse, we went to the pastor's office. Uh -huh. Then I was really like, why? And um, then it was for the pastor to tell us, but my dad was there. So then I saw him, but I knew he wasn't dead, but I thought he was dead for a couple of weeks before I found out. Wow. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, question is that, um, Sometimes people will come in and they're together and they just decide one of them's going to, you know, claim the other kid. I mean, claim the kid, right? Right. And they can do that if they have, if they're in agreement on that, right? Or yes, they don't have to use tiebreaker rules. It's only when they're not in agreement. Only when they're not in agreement. Okay. Gotcha. That's good. Yeah. 
they can decide themselves right out. They can just say, okay, this is your year. You go ahead or, okay. or whatever it may be. You know, it doesn't make a difference if they're in okay. agreement. If they're in agreement, it's great. That's not a problem. It's when they're not in agreement that it turns into a disaster. Okay. That's what I figured, but I just wanted to double check. Yeah. The, uh, the biggest thing is, are they in agreement? Cause if they are in agreement, there's no problem. It's like everything. It's like a divorce. If in a divorce you're in agreement, even if um, here's a here's an important fact that's really important in regards to the one particular year, and that's the year of a divorce. What is the law in Washington versus the law in Oregon in regards to a divorce? I don't know either one. You should probably you you know the law in California. What's the law in California? In regards to a divorce? Yep. In regards to property. Oh, it's split in half because Congratulations. It's property. Congratulations. So is Washington. But Oregon is not. Oregon is not. So what happens when, you know, Bob and Tina decide they've had it with each other and they are gonna get a divorce in Washington? Everything gets split. split. Nothing matters. Okay? Right. Actually, I had the a friend of mine who I had to go and actually testify at his divorce hearing because they were actually fighting for custody as well because that's the one thing that doesn't qualify as 50 50. Um, yeah. he uh, his wife was trying to um, argue about property and everything, and I heard the most unbelievable thing that I had ever heard was he literally